Hey guys, welcome to uh, Human 205 Online. I'm here with Bryce Cofield from George Fox University, and we're gonna be talking about Nella Larson's passing. But before we get into the text, we wanna spend some time thinking about what constitutes identity in the first place, how our intersectional identities work, and what it means to be anything, be that American or Australian or Hungarian or black or white or Ghanan or Christian or Jewish or all of these different things that make us us. Um, how do those work and how do we negotiate those in terms of our individuality and the wider communities that help to form those identities? So Bryce, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, hello, hello. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, evening. I guess that's the cool part about videos. You can watch whenever. Right. So fun. <laughs> also, I'm like fidgeting with this little pink ball. So maybe like, what is in his hand? And this is, it's a cool little fidget ball. So hopefully it's not too distracting. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, I need something to fidget with. Otherwise, I just tend to like, you know, chew on it. Yeah, them. exactly. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah. the nail biter. That's my go-to. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Me too. Okay, well, I'm going to try not to bite my nails because that's like facial touching and introducing all sorts of disease into my body. And we know that's a bad thing to do right now. So <laughs> good. Good. Don't touch your face, don't bite your nails. Okay, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so talking about intersectional identities. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll just use myself as an example to start with. Now, yeah. I, and clearly if you look at me, I am white. I don't glow in the yeah. dark quite as well as my son does, but I am <laughs> white. My mom is super into genealogy and she's done all the cheek swabs to find yeah. out what our actual uh, genetic makeup is. And yeah. I'm like English and Irish and Scottish and Welsh and a bit of Dutch and German and some Scandinavian. The funny thing is with that, it's actually changed over time as more people do these tests. I keep yep, finding the identity my mom told me a year ago is not the same identity that I have today because they've decided sure. I was part European Jew, now I'm not part European Jew. Wow. It just disappeared. Figure it out. Yeah, as they're figuring out the mapping our genetic yeah, DNA. For and sure. It feels problematic to me because mm -hmm. um, I, I've been to England, but none of those other countries. Um, my dad was actually born in Venezuela. And okay. I grew up speaking Spanish in the home. Uh, oh. My grandmother, his mother, was raised in Puerto Rico and lived in oh. Puerto Rico until she was in her 40s and then moved to Colombia with her husband and then Venezuela where my dad was born. When he was a kid, they moved to California, but then they spent time in Mexico as well. Yeah. Kids. Like he lived in Guadalajara for a while. So I grew up with oh. like, like Rich. home for my grandmother being Puerto Rico. Yeah. And my dad's childhood stories being about Southern California and Mexico. For and sure. I'm speaking Spanish, but I'm, according to the DNA and, you know, the family history, white. And these, sure. we, get in, we start to get into these questions like, what does it mean to be anything, right? And then I've got these ah. kids who are half Australian and half American. What does that mean to be, like, Australian, right? It's a national yeah. activity. Yeah. So all of that is to say, we've got these messy sort of things that we bring with us that are not easy to parse. So can, yeah. I know your research works on um, constructions of identity and... For sure. Can you walk us through some of the, um, the issues that I've kind of articulated in a narrative structure here using my own kind of life because it's always safe to talk about your own life, right? Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. It's messy, right? What, what, is, what does it mean to be Ugh. anything in terms of race yeah. and ethnicity? And is that something I as an individual choose or is that something that the community shapes? Sure. Dynamic work. Oh, there's so much. Um, actually, we should like teach a class. I feel like you could do a whole class diving into the idea of, of identity because it's rich and it's complex. Um, and and frankly, in, in some ways, right, it's also changing. It's being constructed, right? So you hear me talk about race and a lot of other scholars as well talk about race as a, as a social construct, right? Meaning it, it is made and I'll get into more detail, but I think because it's construct, it's constructed, it's also being reconstructed. Right, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, again, I identify as black, and I'll also use the word am identified as black. I think that's one of the common, um, I think, dynamics of a racial identity is being how you are identified, right? And so, again, I'll share some of my story, but I'm identified as black. And so if we were to, like, sort of rewind um, even 20, let's, uh, 20, 100, let's say maybe 100 and... 30 years or so, math is hard for me, um, but prior to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, right, that effectively um, had freed enslaved people, 
you had certain constructions of who black folks were, right? And of course they weren't called black folks at the time. I think it was like Negroes and a whole bunch of other things like that, right? But what it meant specifically, right? We talk about intersectional identities for me to be a black male, how I was um, sort of um, perceived, right? And the, the message that surrounded me was kind of like the Sambo. So you have this almost like Sambo archetype, right? This is the whole like, yes, the master, I'm so happy, blah, blah, blah type of um, stuff around um, who a black male is and how he's happy to be enslaved. Now, what's interesting, again, going back to the construct of race, what you saw after the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, right? You go back to, um, there's a film called Birth of a Nation, right? At the time, it was a black and white film, silent film. Um, it was held as like the greatest um, uh, s sort of cinematic production like of its time. You had like presidents going to watch it, all this sort of stuff. Um, and what you saw, of course, it was it, it was all white folks, but specifically men in black face portraying black men. There was a huge shift, right? No longer was the black man this sort of happy-go-lucky Sambo, happy to like serve and do whatever. This black man was now this violent black brute, right? This um, ape-like, gorilla-like, driven by primal sort of desire um, to both destroy as well as to take and, and really... I mean, rape, right, was, was at the core of this sort of emotion of this violent black group um, that was portrayed, again, by a white man in blackface. That was the, the sort of dominant image um, at the turn of the 20th century, right, what some scholars have identified as the Nader period. Um, so I was a black studies major, and a lot of my thesis was looking at the Nader period, which is um, the period that had the most lynchings, right, of black folks in our country's history. We're talking like thousands of folks being lynched. Thousands of people showing up at these things called lynch picnics, taking whole families to come and watch people um, being lynched. And so I mentioned it around the construction of race because how blackness was constructed, and I would say historically has always been to serve a purpose, right? So it served the purpose of, a, of, a, of an economic system built around slavery to create a black male who's happy to serve in that system, right? Because you could justify then the impression and enslavement of a black person because it benefited them, right? When slavery was no longer allowed in that way, to be clear, slavery is still legal within the prison system. Watch the documentary 13, brilliant. Um, but outside of the, the prison industrial complex, slavery um, as existed was no longer available. And so what you saw, right, there's a reconstruction period um, where there's this vibrant black community starting to explode. Um, and um, there were economic, right, sorts of forms of competition. There was fear within a lot of white folks like, well, huh, well, we, what we did um, whether it was the separating of families, um, reaping of um, enslaved women, these sorts of things. There's fear that now black folks were gonna go and sort of return evil for evil in that way, right? Um, and so fear was present and a desire to then control. So if you can control via slavery a black community, you could control via fear and terror, right? And so this is where you start to see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, right? The Klan like didn't exist in the time of slavery, right? When you have black folks that were effectively were chattel sort of um, like property, right? You could be punished for, you know, harming and killing someone's property. You see the rise of the KKK, fear, control. Mm -hmm. And it was justified because this idea of, uh, for black men specifically, this black brute, right? So we were actually saving um, ourselves and our community, specifically white women who were believed to be like the object of black men's gaze they wanted to group. Uh, they wanted to group. So it's a super long explanation, but I say it because I think there's a few things that are important. One, it, race is constructed, right? How um, different racialized sort of beings are, are understood is consistently being constructed and reconstructed to fit a particular um, paradigm, right? For a specific purpose we can get into. Okay. Ooh, I'm a breathe. Hopefully that all made sense. Um, to get into a little bit of, uh, go ahead. I've been okay. talking. You so, talk. Based on what you've just said, it, not only is race constructed, but race seems to be constructed by people with power mm -hmm. to solidify power, as opposed to being something constructed by the by a community that's being oppressed. For sure. To um, celebrate their own uniqueness or their own experience or their own contribution. So I, right. I, think that's, I mean, that's one of the interesting things in that, in that historical explanation is that 
that blackness in America is something that is very much a white construction for the purpose first of enslavement and then yep. of control. Yep, for sure. You're spot on. Where does the internal community construction of identity come from then? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Where do I start? Where do I start? It's so good. And there's so many things I want to affirm in what you just said. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the internal, but what stood out that I think um, is important for folks to think about. And for me, when I was first thinking about it, I was like, this doesn't make any sense, but then it does. We tend to think um, that you have race and this concept of race, and then people individually, you know, end up having this, um, you have racism, right? So we'll say it's like, oh, well, I don't like X, Y, and Z sorts of people, so therefore I'm gonna treat them poorly. And that's how you have racism, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, in history and in reality ends up happening is that race as an idea was created to justify racism, not the other way around. Does that make sense? So um, Coates talks about race is the child of racism, not the father, right? You had folks that were going over to the West Banks of the continent of Africa, enslaving people, and then created race to then justify it. It wasn't like they showed up and they're like, huh, I'm seeing these darker skinned folks I don't like that, let me enslave them, right? <laughs> right? right? When it's put that way, it's kind of like, oh yeah, that doesn't make sense. But everything I had been like taught and read and understood was that, again, racism is because people don't like people of a different color. When in reality, you know, no, again, racism is very much tied to an economic system, particularly in the US, that being a capitalist system, that then, right, sort of created race to justify um, yeah. we are ways of exploiting other human beings. And I think we see that when we think about, um, other contexts of racism historically, such as the English's treatment of the Irish, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they, they both glow in the dark, right? Like they're both white as can be. Sure, sure. And the Irish are constructed as a racial other so that right. England can colonize them starting in the 17th right. century and yep. um, you know, effectively enslave them and, and take their land and then use them in the factory system yep. as basically slave labor in the early part of the Industrial Revolution. For sure. But there's sure. no, I mean, like, um, phenomenologically, like you wouldn't, is that the word I'm looking for? No, phenologically, there's no, um, yeah, phenotypically, yep. yeah, phenotypically, like they, you know, there's nothing there, and yet there's this racial construction of the island. Oh, yeah. Totally. I mean, if folks have family who are Italian, especially going back east to like New York, right? When you look at like folks that were coming through Ellis Island and immigrating, like Italians for a good long while were pretty close to being like black during that time in terms of how Italians were viewed, how mm -hmm. Italians were treated. Um, you would look at the lived experience of Italian folks at that time, and until laws that then incorporated Italian folks, right, into the system of whiteness that gave access to property, gave access to voting rights, things like that, right. if the Italians would have been seen and treated somewhat similar to other folks of color, even though, uh, to your point, phenotypically, we would see them as white now, right, right? You're, you're spot on. And I'm thinking of, um, like, the Jewish community as well. So yes, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I think it's really important for um, like students to get their heads around that, that race is not, that yeah, race is the child of racism, not that race produces racism. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So that's a good question about like internal dynamics of mm -hmm. communities and race, right? Um, so the, the best way I could describe it is thinking through some of the nuances between race and ethnicity, mm -hmm. right? So oftentimes we see them uh, coupled together, right? Or conflated, right? Like what's your race slash ethnicity? And when you have to mark something on, you know, some survey or I don't know, I just took the census, I don't really remember, but it's usually like, what's your race, ethnicity, race, ethnicity. Um, they're not the same thing, right? So race, again, if I were to overly simplify defining race, I would say race is how we are seen and how we are perceived, mm -hmm. right? Which is normally a function of um, or, or affected by three main things. That's gonna be our eye color and eye shape, our hair color and hair texture, um, and then certain facial features, right, around like our nose and our mouth, right? So you have like eyes, nose, mouth, and hair in terms of shape and texture, in addition to obviously skin color, um, that end up forming how we understand race and see people. Mm -hmm. So perfect example, growing up, I very much identified as Chinese, right? Um, when we talk about ethnicity, uh, what we're talking about are, again, how we tend to think about cultures, whether that's traditions, um, you know, somewhat surface level things like, well, uh, sorry, let me take that back, not surface level 
Um, we think about like our um, food. Uh, so your dining, your decor, what you wear, um, you know, dance can be part music, right? Those sorts of things can exist, but also deeper level things around um, like religious identities or spiritual traditions. We come with all form um, different ethnic identity groups. Does that make sense? And so again, I grew up in a Chinese family, right? Where our holiday traditions were informed uh, a lot by East Asian, specifically Chinese culture. A lot of the food that we ate right, informed in the same way. So I grew up thinking right. myself as Chinese, right? Part of my life story is being removed from the black side of my family. But every day, all day at school, people would be like, you're black, and they'd be like, I'm Chinese. And they'd be like, no, you're black. And I'd be like, no, 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 like, really? Like, I'm Chinese. My mom's last name is Wong, right? Uh, in my mind, like, that's what it meant. And the reality is I was, I was both. I am both, yeah. right? Chinese is a rich part of my ethnic identity. Um, however, racially, how I'm seen, how I'm perceived, and even more importantly, how I'm treated is as a Black person, yeah. right? So in a lot of ways, one's racial identity has more so to do with how people see and treat you than how you would internally identify, which feels wrong, right? Because I think, especially for those of us that would identify or be uh, U.S. citizens, there's this hyper sense of individualism that says, like, I am, like, who I am, like, no, I'm Chinese. You need to see and acknowledge me as Chinese. Mm -hmm. But again, looking at the, the sort of construct and the role that race has played throughout history, and even today, has very little to do with how you see yourself, right? So uh, very real story. Right now with COVID-19, um, we're seeing a huge influx of specifically anti-Asian racism mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, just recently, I think it was yesterday or something, there was an Asian family um, who was stabbed, right? Um, and they believe, there's good reason to believe because of how the individual was shouting all this sort of uh, anti-Asian anti racist, um, so to speak, um, that it was because of, you know, race, right? It was a, a hate-based. Now, this was not a Chinese family, right? right? But this person's like, oh, no, you're Asian, you must be Chinese, right? So another perfect example, they are Chinese. They wouldn't identify as Chinese. However, yeah. they are and as though they are Chinese, right? And were stabbed because of it. That, I think, is, is a horrifying mm -hmm. it, how race has played a role in this country and how it can be connected, but isn't always necessarily connected to how we see ourselves in our own ethnic identities. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, which makes it then interesting when we start to think about, um, I, I want to go back to the internal then construction of community because that seems to also be a part of maybe the response to race and racism, right? Sure. Once you are created as a community because you've been defined this way by other people, yeah. that starts to then shape a sort of internal experience of what it means to be this us even totally. if that is created by a process of othering that power has done to that community. And I'm thinking yep. about this specifically then around the black community because of course the East African slave trade was drawing on a whole bunch of people from all sorts of different um, ethnic and tribal and what we would now identify as national backgrounds. Yeah, sure. Even, totally. even national backgrounds are really problematic in Africa because it was totally drawn up by a bunch of Europeans Correct. through colonization. Yep. So yep. It was, now, that, um, it. So it's not like it was, um, entirely one people group who had a coherent culture that they were able to continue, right? Because with, within yeah. the plantation system, you get For this sure. mixing of African cultures and traditions. Yep. It becomes its own unique thing. Yep. Yep. Um, so when do we start to see that switching? Um, or maybe that's not, the, that's not the right way to phrase the question. When, do, when does Black experience in America start to become an internally defined experience where the black community would also maybe be like, no, you don't get to just join into this yeah. because you want to. And, and so again, a little bit of just to make this more uh, like contemporary. Um, so I have three quasi brothers. It's a long, complicated story. I've got these three brothers sure. from Picasso uh -huh. who grew up there and they kind of came in and replaced me when I moved to Australia. My parents were very unhappy. So they got rid of me and got my brother Jojo instead, who was already like a grown up. So it was perfect. It was just yeah. Replace the child. Um, and he's, he's awesome. Like, I love Jojo and Emmanuel and, and Michael. They're like three of the most amazing Christian guys I know and just like so important to my family and such an important, like important people in my life. But they're from Burkina Faso. Mm. That's its own 
unique culture, unique country. It has its own church traditions. It's got its own political issues. Um, and their reception by the black community in America is really complicated. Like they're very, like they're part of the African club, which yeah. is people from Africa who have immigrated here, not black Americans. So there's a definite sort of distinction between being African and being sure. black as an American in their mind. Yeah. So when does that start to become, when does the black community start to see itself as this, as a community that'll be like, no, actually you're not like us. Yeah. Does that make like that sort of sure. like, no, like that, class that has a rich in its own history to offer as opposed to a um, enslaved people that have been brought over totally and being defined by the outside? That's a really oh. long setup for a question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got you. Uh, and it's also worth worth clarifying. So I'm not. I know a bit about history. Almost not a history major. Um, and so, you know, as I'm consistently learning, right, my my perceptions, understanding of how things have come to be about. Um, that ultimately impact our contemporary situation is, is also shifting, right? Yeah. So I think it's important to acknowledge that up front. Um, what you're saying is, is spot on correct, right? There, there exists a very real tension mm -hmm. between folks who, again, are, let's say, d descendants of an enslaved people, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to um, Black folks um, who have like, somewhat recently immigrated to the U.S., right? Um, this like for second, th you know, third generation, whatever, whatever that may be. But, so your question about like, when did that occur? Um, honestly, I don't, I don't know. I couldn't like point to like a specific date um, of when that would occur. But what I, what I will say is um, that there, there are two things that come to mind. One, I think there's just as much of what you described is this sense of like, uh, let's say American black folks, right? And then I say that because black, as I and a lot of other folks use the term, is used really as like an all-encompassing um, umbrella, right? That includes people across the African diaspora, right? So there are black folks in France, you have black folks um, in Brazil, you have black folks um, in Cuba, black folks in the US, right? And so, um, yeah, so we'll say like American black folks. I think, yeah, there is a dynamic of, okay, you're coming over, um, and almost like a, a pausing, I want to say, to use a very um, academic term, a almost side eye, right? Of, okay, I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna watch. Um, and that exists for sure. I think what is equally, and again, this is my own experience, I'm not gonna say like for everyone or all scholars. I think what is just as, and maybe even more so present, and what I've seen in red, are ways in which folks who have somewhat recently sort of immigrated to the U.S. very intentionally and for um, uh, utilitarian and pragmatic purposes try to distance themselves from American Black folks, yeah. right? I think that's what I've seen experienced more than anything else, right? So I think around the, the world mostly, um, there's an understanding of what it means to be Black in America, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there are very problematic messages that are associated with black folks, again, that are constructed by people in positions of power, right? right? Um, and so people around the world know that. And so I think when folks end up coming to the U.S., somewhat understandably so, they're not wanting to associate with those specific messages, yeah. right? And so there's, there's intentional distancing, right? So you can look at actually a lot of larger college campuses, for example, you'll have like an African student union and a black student union. So some might be like, why do you have an African student union and a black student union, right? When they're all black folks. And there's a lot of truth, right? There's this idea of like pan-Africanism that was developed by Du Bois in the turn of the 20th century that says there's an interconnected nature and that's true. And the lived experiences of folks that have just somewhat recently immigrated from Africa to those that are descendants of enslaved folks in America are unique. Right? There could be language dynamics yeah. um, for folks that have recently immigrated from Africa that, say, Black Americans don't necessarily have, right, in terms of being perceived as a foreigner. Um, there's, there's a lot there, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are nuances, but I think more than anything else, what I've seen and experienced is an initial desire from recent immigrants to separate themselves from Black folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I saw that, I think about um, conversations with my grandfather who, uh, step, step grandfather, who in talking about race, he was like, he would always say, like, you're not black. And I'd be like, okay, again, when I was younger, he'd be like, oh, like, okay, yeah, like I'm Chinese, and it was fine. And then enter into undergrad, and I'm a black studies major, and I'm like, oh no, I'm black. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm black. And he'd be like, you're not black. And he'd be like, no, I'm pretty 
because you're not black. And you'd be like, no, 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 you're not black. But if you are, like, you can be African, like, be African, right? And so I think there also tends to be this image and narrative of, like, of, um, again, Africa is a continent, not a country, but we tend to like think of it as a monolithic <laughs> sort of space, which it isn't. But it's almost a um, sort of elevating, like of African nobility, right? And there's almost like a purity there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think as a young Black man, I was, I think, told that being a Black American was less than. Yeah. Um, and so there's a complicated dynamic there which might speak to the, the, the other sort of novel you're gonna have folks read. Um, but there's a very complicated dynamic, right? Of both, I think black folks in the, in the US kind of waiting and saying, hey, like, are you down? And by down, I mean like, are you like engaged in the struggle of resistance, mm -hmm. right? I think the commonality between black folks in the US is, under, is understanding to a degree the oppressiveness of being, of, being black in the US, right? The oppressive system that's been created and the necessity to both navigate it um, and to push against it. Yeah. The reality is that for some recent um, folks who've immigrated, there are different histories. So there doesn't have to be the same consciousness. And in fact, because of, again, how narratives around um, quote unquote African people have been constructed, to a degree, people can opt out of it and be like, I don't like, why do I need to sacrifice myself, my family for the struggle, right? And so I think that causes a sense of hesitation for some. Now, speaking in gross sort of generalizations, but that would be my, my best um, sort, of, uh, yeah. sort of response. No, I think that's all really helpful because it helps to, I think, give, give us some sort of concrete um, ideas and images around which we can start to understand the complexity of Black identity in America. Um, and the reality that for recent experience, sorry, recent immigrants from Africa, their experience of themselves within the wider black community is going to be really complicated while at the same time those same dynamics of racism are going to identify them as simply black yep. and as part of this other story even though within that within the black community they're like no i'm actually an, an immigrant from africa yep. and so then to be black in america involves its own sort of negotiation of multiple identities of um the history of, of um, forced slavery, the history yep. of um, systemic oppression and violence, yep. and then this other history of a sort of African purity that's mm. like almost like a lot, like the way you're describing that narrative, it's almost like a, like a stolen Eden. Yeah, sure. It also then marks blackness in America as doubly less than, right? You've got, it's sure. less than the white, marked as less than the white power structure by the white power structure, yep. and then marked as less than this lost past. Yep. Um, and so that, so sure. because really, that to be part of that community is something then that becomes marked by, by these kind of multiple layers of loss and then multiple layers of resistance. That's right, that's right. No, that you're, you're spot on. And I, and I also, I feel like must say too, right? You're also asking someone um, again, who identifies as black, right? And American, so this is like my own perspective. What would be fascinating is if you were to bring in, you know, your brothers and other folks and say, well, how are you seeing it, right? Like what, what, what are your sort of perceptions of the inclusion or exclusion of African folks by, you know, the black community, the American black community, right? Because again, this is like from my own vantage point, which, you know, things one way. Um, and of course, you know, my own, positionality is going to affect the, the narratives I'm constructing in my head. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I, I, um, I have this other very good friend, Mary, who she's from Kenya. Um, uh -huh. I met her through Notre Dame. She's uh, involved in the Masters of Peace Studies uh, program there. And she works with like international nonprofits. Um, but she's from, the tribe that she's from in Kenya has been like the ruling class tribe, thanks to the way that the British set up um, yep. The, yep. Back in the you know, 19th century as part of colonialism and all of that mess. Um, and so it's really interesting to hear her talk about both her experience as a Kenyan who is in a position of power and is marked within Kenyan culture as, she says that she is in Kenya, she is structurally white. Yeah, in sure, terms in terms of, of power, the power, power of privilege, yeah. And then her experience of coming to America and you know, studying in America in the upper Midwest, which has its own you know, interesting and complicated history of <laughs> uh, racism and oppression and yeah, it's a good and at the same point. time, thinking it's better than the South because you know it was the destination on the Underground Railroad or something like that. Kind of sure. weird 
um, we're, we're not racist like them, except for super racist, right? Cause, for sure. It's just in your face in the South. Here, you know, in the Midwest and Pacific Northwest, we try to, you know, figure out what's behind the eyes, you know, because I'm going to yeah. smile at you with my eyes, but... What's really going on? Yeah. Mm. You know, so I would love to have my brothers and Mary and you and, and probably my husband too, who's the Australian, who's always being like co-opted into white American identity and going, I am part of the Commonwealth, you know, like he and Mary <laughs> have conversations about like cricket and the British government. And, you know. So all of these different ways that we negotiate our identity. Um, it, it's really something that, yeah, it's, I, I recognize you can only speak from not only your own personal experience, but also your research, because that's the thing. You, as much sure. as you, we all speak from our own experience, you've also got a lot of, you know, like real knowledge because you're doing some really exciting research around these areas around um, construction of identity and race. So 